Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Digital Health's latest best practice webinar. As always, for those who don't know me, my name is Hannah Crouch, and I'm the editor at Digital Health. Um, please, just a quick uh, disclaimer, I'm slightly losing my voice, so you're, probably your audio has not gone funny, it's just me, and um, so I'm going to keep my talking to a minimum. Um, but anyway, as to our introductions, uh, I'm sure many of you on this webinar today are aware that the government's health and care bill puts legal obligations on NHS England to ensure every area in England is covered by the Integrated Care System or Integrated Care Board. Alongside this, a deadline of April 2022 has been set for integrated care systems to have smart digital and data platforms in place. So what does this mean for NHS trusts? Our best practice webinar today features a team at Hartford Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust, who will be setting out some key aims of the trust and exploring how it will operate in the future within the integrated care system framework. I'm joined on the call by some of those involved with the trust. We have Hakan Akazek, who's the CIO, we have Paul Bradley, who's CCIO and consultant psychiatrist, and Avi Reddy, who's head of information, business intelligence and system delivery. We're also joined on the call by Mark Smith, who's the business development director for the UK at Novacom. After our group have spoken, we'll then have the main Q&A session. Um, just a reminder, those with questions, you can ask them at any point during the webinar. Um, best place to do this, please, 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 is in the Q&A section. And you can also vote for your favourite questions. Um, also, if you would like to ask, have your questions, sorry, direct to anyone um, in particular, um, please let me know. Uh, I'm now going to stop talking and preserve my voice and I'm going to hand over to our presenters, so please take it away. Oh, Hakan, I think you're on mute. It's always good to start with a little <laughs> mistake, isn't it? Good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and thank you for joining us. Um, um, hopefully, I won't take too much of your time. I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you a very brief introduction to our digital strategy and, and, and why we think interoperability uh, plays a key role in everything we're trying to do to help improve the health and well-being of our services and carers by using digital technologies. Um, when we started our journey, as, as you can see in the slide, I think one of the earlier things we've done is um, try to get to grips with what we would the future to look like. Um, we've been very privileged that um, hundreds of our staff, um, our service users and carers um, have worked uh, with us on this journey. And, and we've quickly got to a place where we could articulate what the future should look like from their different perspectives. Now, on, on the face of it, if you, if you look at the ask, uh, they are not particularly difficult things. Um, um, they are not particularly um, onerous things um, to ask for. But as we all know, in the digital world, um, given where we are, um, sometimes there's a bit of a process to go through that journey. So um, in order to help us going through that journey, um, we also agreed a set of uh, what we call strategic principles. Um, and, and that was our answer to where does digital come in, if you like. Having defined digital as a way of doing things rather than a thing in itself, we had to focus on um, where it would be useful to us. And, and these are the four key areas uh, that we've decided to focus on at HPFD. Focusing on making sure that our services and carers experience a seamless journey, both within HPFD and across our healthcare, health and care partnerships. Uh, making sure that our service users and caterers are supported by the new and emerging digital solutions um, to help with their decision making and um, self management. Um, we decided to focus on making sure that our staff make the best use of technology so that they can spend as much of their time as possible with our service users and carers to help them, or at least on the activities that will help them improve the service. And also as an organization, we, we decided to focus our interventions to make sure that all our decisions are informed and based on accurate information. So the developing the strategy has, has been the um, best part of a six month of journey for us. Um, and, and this is essentially where we ended up. What, what you see in front of you is, is a one page summary of our digital strategy. Um, when we looked at um, how to approach delivering things, we, we took a, a capability-based approach, as we call it. So we looked at 
what digital ways of doing things that we need to create and, and we call them digital capabilities for the um, lack of a better terminology, I suppose. Now, looking at this retrospectively, the most interesting thing for me is a, a, a lot of them are fairly non-technical descriptions. And, and the only technical thing that sticks out to me is at the bottom left-hand corner where it says interoperability. And that there's a very good reason for that. So when, when, when we looked at how we achieve these things, and, and most of my colleagues on the call will probably relate to this, you quickly realize that uh, you will always work in a complex systems and information environment. And, and there will always be the need to move the information from one place to another without having to duplicate it, just to make sure that it is available when it's needed and it can be put to best use. And that's essentially what put interoperability at the very heart of our journey, at the very heart of our digital strategy. And that's why we decided to articulate interoperability as a digital capability in its own right. Um, and, and one of the things that is worth recognizing with a digital strategy is it's, it's one of the few things that we do in an organization that essentially touches every single service user, every single carer, every single member of staff, every single um, stakeholder. And, and it was important for us to get that right with a, a good architecture, both for our information and our systems um, with interoperability at the very heart of it. Now I'm gonna stop there and I'm going to hand it over to Abi Reddy um, to talk us through um, a bit more on the more exciting and technical sides of, of the interoperability journey that we're in at the moment. Avi, over to you. Thank you very much, Haken. Good afternoon, all. Just going to share my screen. So just give it a second, please. Right, so I'm guessing my screen's being shared now. So, um, hi, my name is Avi Reddy, and um, I'm the head of information business intelligence system there for HPFT. So, in short, anything to do with data capture and reporting and other stuff comes under my remit. And that's the first slide. And uh, this is a slightly different presentation of the digital strategy. So um, I think we started the journey back in 2019, but then because of COVID, we had to reject the strategy in terms of what we deliver. So a few things where we had to fast track, a few things we had to push back. But um, if you look at the picture there, so we've got four main circles. So kind of like the other four key pillars of the digital strategy. So the first one is empowering our service users and carers. The next one is digitally enabled workforce. The next one is partnership and systems leadership. And the last one is digitally enabled CAD delivery. So all of these pillars are kind of like key components for success. And there is no a one size that fits all. So then if you just take one kind of like circle, for example, so in terms of empowering our services and carers, there are multiple tools out there that could be used. So in that case, obviously um, you've got different systems that has got data captured as well. So um, it is key that in this current day and age in technology, we've got to ensure that all of the systems talk together. So in that case, we can give the full picture. So, um, and um, obviously this is where uh, interoperability comes in really. So it's kind of like it's at the heart of everything that we do. So um, if I go on to the next slide. So this is our technical architecture. So we've tried to put it in very simple form. So in that case, we've got kind of like service user portal, staff portal, third party functions. But then if you look at it, all of them, majority of them are the center, we've got the integration in between. So it's kind of like it acts as an uh, orchestra and kind of like grabs information from one system, passes on to another. So and obviously with multiple systems, with multiple technologies out there, it's kind of like, for example, to put um, the reference in simple terms, you've got one system that is in French, example purposes, you've got another system that's in German. So in that case, obviously the two systems can't talk together. And so in that case, the integration engine kind of like gets the data from the German system and converts it into a format that the French system can take in and similarly vice versa. So in that case, it's kind of like the center of heart of everything that we do. So, but then obviously it's not kind of like facing, external facing as such. 
So on to the next slide. So this slide is about what we have done so far, 2021-2022. So um, the first project that we have done, we used um, interoperability was the remote care clinical outcomes. So I will explain a bit more about this project later down the line. So um, it's where service users get an opportunity to complete the outcomes digitally from their own devices without turning, uh, I mean, there's no need for them to turn up to the appointment and fill it at the point of appointment. So in that case, just before the appointment, service users completed all the details and the clinician has got them in front of them and they can have more meaningful conversations about the care, et cetera, and other stuff rather than starting off from scratch. And the next project we've got is the remote monitoring physical health project. So this one is really interesting one whereby we gave um, blue box kind of like a device with vital uh, sign monitorings out to service users and we asked them to complete it. And once they take the readings at regular intervals, the data is then immediately sent over to us via the internet and back into our clinical system and notifies the clinician. So that's a really good one end to an interoperability that we achieved. And uh, this currently we have highlighted as Amber because it's in progress, it's not live. So in that case, we're working with um, two different suppliers in terms of digital dictation and uh, delivery of SMS reminders and letters digitally to our service users. And the next one is we've got a service user portal. So whereby we'll have all of our letters, clinical outcomes, everything available source there as well. That's another project that we are working on. And finally, we've got the share care record. So um, again, this is just a small list of important pieces of work that we're working on. And that's just for this year. So in that case, for next year, we've got a few more other projects planned as well. So now going on to the projects. So one good case study is uh, remote monitoring, so physical health. So as you can see my screen, yeah, that's the blue box device that we give out to a service user. So it's got a tablet and it's got kind of like your temperature, blood pressure, et cetera, pulse monitoring, et cetera. So the instructions is that we give it out to a service user or clinician, but then may, may, mostly we are trying to give it out to a service user and we're gonna ask them to take a reading once every two days. And once they have done that, then the data gets pushed on to the integration engine. So, and once the integration receives it, then it pushes the data onto our clinical system. So it's available there immediately in live fashion. So there's no delays whatsoever. And after that, obviously there is a small extra step as well, whereby we send a notification email out saying that service user X has uh, taken readings and these are the readings and it's now been pushed into the clinical record. So in that case, that's for the clinicians or the team admin staff to um, kind of like um, review that. And at the bottom, you've got uh, screenshots of Paris, that's our clinical system. So in kind of like, you can see exactly uh, what kind of like measures and what readings are being taken and how it's being displayed. And the graph here on the left so far is the number of uh, readings that we have recorded. So in that case, we have recorded close to 293 uh, heart rate readings of multiple service users since go live date. And similarly, we've got oxygen levels that we have monitored, body temperature, blood pressure, et cetera, blood weight, glucose, et cetera, as well. So um, as we get our groups towards this, so there are more and more kind of like vital sign measures that we are adding on to this so we can capture it remotely. And we are looking to share this information to our GPs as well. So in that case, they get access to the data as well as possible. And the next project is the remote cap project. So this one is a really good, interesting one as well. So we have automated the process of capturing clinical outcomes uh, as much as possible. So uh, one example is, for example, uh, in our trust, uh, we've got um, adult eating disorder service. So they came in and uh, they've said, look, yeah, we'd like to um, go first with this. And our medical director wanted us to be an outcome led organization. So in mental health, so um, obviously it's gonna to be tough for us to evidence uh, discharge, et cetera, and other stuff. And one good way of it is trying to ask the same sort of questions throughout the treatment. So in that case, at the point of admission, you get somebody that says I've got high level of uh, anxiety and depression. And as you start treating them towards the end, obviously uh, they come in and say, well, yeah, I've got low levels of anxiety and depression. And that's kind of like evidence driven discharge. So when our clinicians have kind of like had quite a lot of stuff that they're, they're, they're capturing. So in a 60 minute appointment, they spend quite a lot of time capturing data. So in that case, we didn't want to overburden them by capturing outcomes as well. 
So in that case, we slightly tweaked it and said, well, why can't we give our service users the opportunity to complete it digitally first? So in that case, um, then obviously uh, there'll be a small cohort of service users who don't complete it digitally. So in that case, clinicians have got a small caseload to work with. So just quick run through to this one. So at the beginning, we get a referral to HPFD. So it gets registered on a clinical system. And um, for eating disorder service, they've said um, 10 days from the referral received date, we want you to send a message out to the service user. So in that case, between Paris and uh, between Questlink, which is our clinical outcome system. So the integration engine has got the rules in place. So in that case, it'll pick up all of the referrals that are 10 days exactly. And then it'll just send it on to Questlink. And once it's sent it on to Questlink, then obviously the system then sends the message out with links. So in that case, the service user receives a link from HPFD NHS. So in that case, there's not phishing. So they click on the link, they complete it, and they've got option to opt out as well. So as soon as they complete it, the data from Questlink is then shared to the integration engine, and the integration engine then pushes that into our clinical system. So in that case, our clinicians, they don't need to log into a third-party system. They can just log into our clinical system itself, click on the link, and view what the outcomes are like. So in that case, and this process is repeated automatically once every 10 weeks. So in that case, as long as the service is open to the trust, the system automatically generates these messages once every 10 weeks and they complete it. And at the end of it, we hope we get a diagram like that at the bottom below on the left-hand side. So where they say the condition was really, really risky at the beginning, and now they're already in green. So in that case, they're all completely recovered or in a better position than they were at the point of admission. So uh, those are the two big projects that we have done. So um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Abby. Um, we're going to now sort of have a very, very fashionable um, fireside chat now, I think, is what they call, call it now. I think all the trendy NHS chiefs have them now. Um, so I'd like to welcome back our speakers. And um, we're just going to put a few questions to them first before we open the floor. Um, Paul, I think you've got the, the tough one up first. Is, could you explain a bit more about what the benefits of these projects are for service users and patients? Yeah, thanks, Hannah, and thank you, Hakan and Abby, for, for talking us through the, the, the what and the how, and I suppose this is the why, isn't it? Um, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm going to go out there and say, I don't think it's possible to deliver um, great care uh, and demonstrate great outcomes without having interoperability, without having data moving around seamlessly between systems. I think no matter how good your EPR is, I think you're always going to have, to have boundaries that you need to deal with and you need to deal with them really effectively. Um, we put people at the heart of our strategy, um, but we also want to put data at the heart of our strategy. We had a slightly uh, complicated uh, versions of, of our diagram along the way. Um, if you get data moving effectively, uh, then it frees people up to deliver great care. Um, and I mean that across, across all the, the measures of quality. So allows people to deliver care that's really effective, um, allows people to, to do the things that make a difference um, and then show that that's happened. It allows safety um, to be improved. Um, so all those things where you haven't got the right information in front of you or it hasn't gone into the right place, um, so you haven't picked it up and been able to act on it, uh, good movement of data allows you to, to address that really effectively. Uh, and crucially, it allows experience to be improved. Um, so all of our uh, service users, we call them all of our carers, all the citizens across uh, receiving any experience of health and care in the NHS have a, a sort of hope and a belief that the NHS is, is one organisation. Um, unfortunately, most of us know behind the curtain it's a lot more complicated. Um, and even within one trust, you can have multiple systems that don't talk to one another. Um, and I'm, I'm so pleased that we're now able to, to move towards a position where they really do. Um, and so the experience of joined up care within our trust and across the integrated care system um, is going to become a reality. Lovely, thanks Paul. Um, next question I was going to ask is, because um, I think big kind of you know, buzzword that you lots of things is clinical engagement and how clinical staff feel about it. So how do they kind of feel about this area of work that's being done? Because I'm guessing it's kind of happens a lot of it in the background and kind of doesn't really affect their day to day, but how do they sort of feel about it? Yeah, I think there's a there's an emotional roller coaster. I'll be very <laughs> frank ab about this. That there's initially anxiety, mm. um, fear, distrust. Yeah. Um, I think you've got plenty of clinical staff in the NHS who've 
uh, developed a, probably a healthy cynicism about uh, technology projects um, who've seen the great uh, you know, promise um, of integrated systems, of, of national programs, dare I say, um, that haven't quite delivered what they've wanted and indeed have been poorly designed, poorly implemented, poorly supported. Um, and we've ended up in, in the situation that many of us still are in with silos um, and a lack of movement. Um, however, obviously, that's what we work to overcome. Um, as I said, put people first, um, but make sure that we've got a really robust approach to the other aspects of it. So process, including clinical safety. Avi's already touched on um, some of the important things. So whenever we're uh, gathering data from people or in an automated digital way, then we want to make sure there are checks and balances that that information gets flagged up in the right way um, so that it's not invisibly going into either a system that someone may not think to look in um, or indeed into a personal email address or something like that. So at almost every stage of the process, we've had really great clinical engagement. Um, uh, we're, we're very lucky in HPFT, of course, we've got a, uh, a wonderful group of, of staff that are really keen to make improvements. We've got a, a very active improvement culture in the trust. Um, uh, and then we get on to the positive bits, the positive emotions. Um, so there's joy. Um, I, I don't hesitate to, to use that word. We should aim for a bit more than satisfaction. Um, we, we actually get joy when you see that uh, it may sound like a very trivial little thing. You take a blood pressure reading or a heart rate and within seconds you've seen it electronically transferred through what most of our staff quite happily consider just to be magic. Um, Avi's told us a bit more of the science behind it and it appears in our EPR and they think all that time that they would have otherwise spent, you know, scribbling down on bits of paper and taking it here and there and opening up another application, um, that's all gone. Um, and so there is genuine joy. And then there's engagement and excitement about the opportunity to keep moving forward with this, um, use it to improve care. Um, and of course, you know, buzzword for buzz phrase for many years, release time to care. Um, we've got so much more demand now already um, than we've got capacity um, across the NHS, across mental health services, especially on I'll venture to say, and, and I think we can only see that demand increasing. Um, so we really have to make the most of the valuable time that we've got of our excellent staff to deliver that care. Um, and they look forward to being on that journey once they've seen the benefits. I cannot, Avi, did you want to add anything or no? No, both shaking your head at me. Um, okay, move on to the next question. Um, so kind of bringing in an overcom, would it be possible just to maybe explain the, the role that they have kind of played in terms of these projects and kind of explore why you chose an overcom um, and what was it that you might, you like most, sorry, about the solution? I'm not sure who's going, who's going for that one. I'll take that one, if that's okay, Hakan and Paul. So, um... Um, integration and other stuff so I think kind of like two years ago um, it was not known to us so in that case uh, we never knew stuff like that were possible so in that case um, we went out uh, spoken to other trust and um, obviously the cool stuff that they were doing so in that case we thought yep we need to do that so in terms of um, procuring it we had to go out for tendering so we went out by the NHS tendering process so in that case, we had to do a technical and a clinical evaluation. So um, on the back of that, so we had uh, quite a few bidders who applied for it. And um, I think an OCOM um, kind of like came out successful from that. So um, in terms of the actual solution, obviously um, um, I don't do the coding myself. So in that case, I had chats with the team. So in that case, uh, they say, it is a low code platform. So in that case, in that case, they don't have to do codings from scratch, et cetera, and other stuff. And plus they've got user-friendly interface uh, with UI, et cetera, and other stuff. So in that case, they can drag drop boxes. And plus they've always had uh, support of uh, subject matter experts at NOCOM as well. So in that case, all of these projects, we have had some consultancy with them uh, by the help desk, design the flows and tells us what the best practice are, et cetera, and others. So, um, and obviously we as an NHS organization, uh, it's not kind of like we've got the same budget as an IT company, but then at the same time, we need to strike the right balance as well. So in that case, having tools like these that are user-friendly, 
and still while right, you've got some coding that we need to do they're more friendly for us really we can use them lovely thank you and then I guess alongside kind of the importance of having clinical engagement and clinical onboarding, as they say, I think it's always really good to have a really strong partnership between supplier and the trust. So it'd be good to kind of discuss how, how's kind of the relationship with an Overcom, how's it been and kind of how's it evolved over the years? I'll, I'll take that one, shall I? Uh, I, I, I? I think that's a fair point, Hannah. I, um, when, when you put um, in, interoperability at the very centre of your journey, I think that relationship with the vendor and, and having it as a partnership rather than a contractual relationship is, 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 is key, I think, um, for a number of reasons. A, um, the, the, these products um, change and evolve over time, and, and, and that gives us the ability to provide input um, to them on things that we would like to see and things we'd like to improve. But on the other side, the vendor always brings a, a greater knowledge of how to approach some of the dilemmas we have because they will have worked these in other care settings and with any welcome, I think uh, we have the advantage of um, their experience outside the UK as well. I, I think it, it, it very quickly, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Mark, but I, I think it very quickly <laughs> um, became, became, became a, a joint purpose. And, and, and I think um, it, it, interesting that both organizations actually have the um, and beneficiaries, the um, service users, carers, and the clinicians in mind when, when they approach this. Um, like Paul articulated, I, I think, um, it is near impossible to deliver a, a great care, great outcomes to people in this day and uh, age without being able to move the data and without um, being able to do it without um, too much fuss. Uh, and, and I think that, that great partnership is what allows that to emerge over time as well by both of us learning from each other. Um, we probably started relatively tentatively. We didn't know each other. Like I said, we undertook a tendering exercise. It went through an evaluation, as it always does, with you know, technical people and clinical people and, and so on. So the beginning of it was probably a bit tentative, I would have thought. But uh, within the space of probably weeks, it, it very quickly uh, moved into a... a, a co-production environment very easily, I, I'd say, around understanding each other's priorities, understanding what's important for our service users and staff and how quickly we can implement them. So that, that, that would be my view. I think that's also a great time to bring in Mark. So I don't know if you kind of want to give, give it from an Overcom perspective, Mark, on, on the partnership. Yeah, so I, I think the first thing to start with is when you get to know Hakan and Avni and Paul is that you need a good sense of humour. Uh, and I mean that in a, in a, in a good way. Um, but I just want to sort of echo what, uh, what Hakan mentioned, and that is that, you know, when you start a new relationship, there's always an element of risk, always, um, and the approach that you take. So um, in my view, you know, you go back to the beginning, um, you need to build that confidence and trust quite quickly. Um, and also the only way that is to do that is to provide full commitment to the cause. And, and, and let's be honest about this, that, you know, uh, Innovacom is um, it is not the most recognised name in the UK, but outside the UK it is, um, and, and we have a lot to learn in the UK. So there's a there's a real desire um, from from our team is to get really into the detail to to look at clinical values um, uh, and also translate some of the information that we have from outside the UK into um, into the organisations. To see where there are any value points to, to, to bring out. Um, so it was very evident from the very beginning that there was a real commitment um, uh, to, to work in this way, uh, and this is what and this is what we would uh, we would want to do, uh, and also to take the digital transformation journey ahead. And of course, we were eager to learn, as I mentioned. So it, you know, for us in the beginning, it's always really important to understand and ascertain what level of skills exist or not, and we take the time to do that. Um, and because of our experience of working with organizations, no matter where they are on their maturity journey, at the digital maturity journey, um, we're able to sort of understand what can and can't be delivered quite quickly. Um, and in fact, in the case of Hertfordshire, there were some, there, there were some sort of um, drivers that were at the time unknown. COVID is one of them, of course. 
uh, which kind of focuses the mind on what the clinicians actually are going to need. Um, and I think that with their diligence and, and with their, uh, with their uh, enthusiasm to master the software in the COVID situation as well, um, and it's meant that we've um, we've been able to move on move on quite a lot. And then as the um, as the organisation um, got more confident with us, they of course want to share other problems uh, and other things, and, um, and and we learned a few things as well along the way. So uh, a good example of that is um, is where the um, uh, there's the, the 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 all trust actually need to look at a shared care record as was mentioned before. Um, and um, this is where there's, there's a, they have some sort of architectural pattern choices. The first one is a centralized model, which is basically where data is held outside the organization in like a regional HIE, for instance. The second is a federated model, which is basically where um, the organization wants to look at having a local data repository um, uh, in the organization. Uh, and we learned the reason they wanted to do that in the federated model is because in mental health care, there's a lot of patients that have sensitive data that they want to keep in as a, a, in the, sort of the original documentation on site. And so working with the organization, we then, with our own experience of uh, digital maturity and a further advanced stage, we're able to look at things like fire data repository, for instance, to get easier access to that data. And then when we bring in Paul, Paul sort of said to me, you know, that what we want to be able to do is get all that data together in one place so that when I sit in front of a patient, I've got a lot more information to actually make a better assessment on, on those things. So it gives them a more holistic view. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Mark. And then sticking with that thing about um, all the sort of the, uh, the the talk you mentioned about Innovacomp being much more, you know, they're not as well known in, in the UK market, they're much more kind of in the French market. And I was just wondering whether there are any similarities in the healthcare landscape, because I think it's often sometimes you're we're more likely to compare with the likes of, um, you know, the US or kind of other countries. But in terms of the similarities with France, an example, you know, are there any other structures like integrated care systems in, Fra in France? Sorry. Yeah. So, so just to just to make a slight correction that we've got other customers internationally. So we've got a lot more customers yeah. internationally, but I, I get your point about looking at the similarities in our native in the native um, in the native country. In fact, yes, here's the thing, right? So the French market does have similar digital transformation projects that are related to the integrated care systems in the UK. In France, we have um, a regional system where it's called a GHT. So this is basically um, a collection of um, of hospitals. So they're coming together. Of course, when you when they want to do that, they also obviously need to take change the technical infrastructure as well to support that new organizational structure, which I said is very similar to the to the to the new evolving ICSs. So, you know, they they kind of will need things like a central data repository, cloud based services, standardization. They're looking at standardization of their integration between those hospitals instead of having multiple integrations, for instance. Um, and um, and also on top of that, you have to start thinking about identity manager because identity management solutions and, and secure access management because you are involving a lot more people and a lot more organisations and therefore um, uh, that is essential as part of looking at your your digital maturity um, as those risks increase. And then just finally, before we open the floor to some other questions, and I think we've got some polls coming up. Um, interoperability and kind of these types of issues, they've historically, they've always, you know, it's never really been easy for health organisations, especially to get one software system, to, you know, to talk to one another. It's, it's long been a problem. And, you know, would it be possible for you to kind of offer your own explanation, Mark, as to why? And kind of, and then also why it is so important to have two systems which can actually talk to each other? Yeah, so so basically, there's a number of there's a number of factors to consider when you answer that. Okay, so the first one is there's still quite a lot of uh, old legacy software systems in the HF that that do not meet health standards, um, and, and these systems, to be honest, didn't really need to previously have to consider the value of exchanging data um, with other software system vendors because you know, let's face it, they want to keep the sovereignty of that data. So why would a why would an organisation um, uh, look at trying to um, lose their sort of intellectual property um, based on that. So there was never really a driver for that. 
Um, and um, the second thing is, is that integration was previously limited to an organization's internal connectivity needs in the trust, um, uh, which relied on the EPR vendor to actually drive that. Now, however, as the volume and complexity um, has increased, um, those internal teams and software vendors are not equipped to have a more sort of um, uh, industrialized and packaged solution, which makes it much easier to do these things a lot faster. Um, and, and, so, and so when you think about that, um, looking at trying to get a comprehensive coverage of integration requirements, I, I'll give you an example. There's a current pain point at the moment, I know for a fact, and in mental health particularly, is that, um, that there's the connectivity requirement between the EPMA, you know, the electronic prescribing, uh, and the EPR uh, and the uh, and the EPR system. Um, and I think that that's an area of real concern at the moment for some, some trust that we've heard. Um, and then I would just like to finish on a word about integration for those on the call that you know, don't necessarily have a good understanding of the, of the subject matter. Um, and so to answer the second part of the question you asked me, it's very important to understand that the exchange of data from one system to another doesn't mean you just dump a set of data into that software system, okay? Um, you need to uh, extract and deliver at the right time in the exact place, the format, the font style, for example, and the, the real reason why that's important is because the clinician that's using that doesn't want to see any changes in the receiving software system that they use on a day-to-day -day basis, clearly, okay? Um, and if I can refer to another case, this is an acute hospital where data was required from a new set, you know, a new set of different types of medical devices, for instance. The clinical team made it very clear to us that we don't want to see any changes in anything that we normally see when that data is actually um, shown to me in my uh, EPR system, for instance. And the only way that will be a successful outcome if you can actually do that. Um, and so, yeah, this was a project that captured vital signs data at various intervals from medical devices. Uh, and that clinical data set would need to be translated uh, and, and placed in the EPR in real time. So there's quite a lot of complexity around that, but what we tried to do is simplify the process of, of being able to do that and empowering teams to actually be able to do that as well. So, you know, the utopia for me, and I think as everyone's trying to get to, is to try and capture the data at the right time along the patient pathway so that multiple services that interact with the patient um, can actually intervene at the right time within that patient journey. So it's almost like, a, as Hakan mentioned in, in the previous presentation, it's about that seamless synchronization of those services across the health economy, which clearly is very complex, complex and it's difficult to, to achieve across those many, many different areas in healthcare. Lovely, thanks so much, Mark, and, and to Paul and Hakan and Avi. Um, we're now gonna open up the floor um, and we've also got a poll running. So I'm hoping that her, the first question should come up soon. Um, so if you could take part in the poll. So yeah, if you've got the question coming up here, it says, um, is your organization's future clinical systems, direction of travel, a best of breed, a single system, or you're unsure? So um, while we've got that going on in the background, I'm going to start opening up the Q&A. Um, so first question that we've got is um, for Paul Hakan or Avi, and it says, what does the interoperability journey look like from 2022 onwards? Um, so you've got to kind of get your crystal balls out and kind of predict the future. Um, so I'm not sure who wants to take that one on. I'll, 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 I'll give it a go, and, and then <laughs> hopefully Avi and Paul can fix it. Um, I, 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 I think that's why we ended up having to recognize interoperability as a capability in its own right. So if, if, if you take integration uh, uh, as a point-to-point -point solution, I want to be able to integrate system A with system B, then addressing that question becomes a lot more difficult because I have no idea what systems will be around in 23, 24, 25, 26. Um, um, and uh, th th that's why we ended up, I mean, to, to a certain extent, this is probably what Gartner calls composable architecture, where we ended up um, having to agree creating um, simpler, smaller digital capabilities that serve a purpose and provide value in their own right that we know we can add or remove from the overall architecture without impacting to the rest of the architecture. 
So um, I didn't talk too much about it, but one of the things in our digital strategy that Mark made a reference to is, for example, a clinical data repository that's a system neutral um, clinical data repository in its own right. So data sitting there as data in its own right so that it can be transacted across multiple systems. So I think my, my hope, I suppose, is, is that um, the healthcare sector will start moving that way where we take the data um, and, and those very valuable records are out of monolithic large EPR systems. I'm not saying they shouldn't exist, but we have to acknowledge that we can't have uh, our services and carriers records locked into systems. Um, that, that, that needs to exist as, as that valuable information as it is in its own right, in, in a way uh, we can share. And that's, I think, my hope is that that's what interoperability will look like where we'll be a lot more um, liberal and a lot more enabled um, uh, to recognize the data in its own right and, and with the appropriate safeguards in place, make sure that for the direct care, it reaches the individual uh, who needs it there. And, and, and I think um, I, would, I, I would like to think that over time, um, it will make it easier for us to make it available to our services and carers as well so that we, we move into that real true co-production environment as, as healthcare delivery. And, and I'd just like to say actually I just had pack on what you mentioned about that is that I, I've noticed that NHS have gone out to all doctors to ask what the what what value of or uh, around the EPR systems that they have at the moment. So that's that's interesting they've done that. Um, and leads into what you're saying about, you know, um, having the data available um, to access um, uh, in its own right. Yeah, there's been really interesting work on, on EPR usability and, and it comes to the whole environment of the electronic records. It's not really just about an EPR anymore. It's about the whole ecosystem, the digital health platform, um, if you like. Um, I, I'll maybe go a little bit beyond 22, 23. I think Abby highlighted a few projects that are on the go at the moment, um, which, which will solve some of our, our issues. But from a clinical and from a care point of view, there are real uh, uh, pinch points when you provide integrated care. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that we hopefully will, will get, get our heads around, um, which will need a lot more involvement from, from suppliers and from partners. Um, so we're, I'm talking about integration in terms of providing um, psychiatric mental health care out into primary care, um, out into GP surgeries, and also into acute hospitals and, and other settings of care. Um, and many of my colleagues tell me they, they have really awkward processes at the moment of double entry um, into systems. Um, we'll get a bit further on when we have a shared record, um, so some headline information can be seen um, but really where we need to get to is so that the, the user experience is designed around that user, that, that person who's giving information, giving a clinical opinion, or the service user or the carer who are sharing their information with us. They should be able to share or record that information once, and that should be you know, seamlessly put into, as Mark's described, the right places in the, in the record, the places that you need to be able to see it. So that when I come in to give my opinion as a, as a consultant psychiatrist, I can pick things up very quickly and easily, um, uh, you know, form a view, have a good conversation, um, which really is the core part of psychiatry, really, um, and then move on to get a recording done quickly in, a, in the right way and, and carry on and, and keep providing more care. So I think those are, those, are, that, those are key points with the integration of services that is coming on at the moment. And, and I'm going to very, very quickly uh, throw attention to something Paul said around, uh, around user experience. Um, and and that, that's why, um, like I said before, we ended up in that sort of um, composable architecture, as it were. There is a recognition that um, if, if, if we use um, complex systems um, to undertake simple tasks, um, we will struggle to get them to, to be used, quite rightly so. We'll struggle to ever find um, staff time to learn those complex systems, and we'll struggle to change them as fast as we often need to change them as the ways we deliver healthcare evolves and, and, and the things we do evolve. Um, and and um, our, our approach by and large, and, and this is where the power of interoperability comes in, I suppose, is 
uh, start, start, start from the uh, user experience side of it, be it a service user, a carer, or a, um, a member of staff. And, and then um, get that to as optimum a place as we can, and then work out how the data moves around and which system it comes out of with what safeguards and how it goes back into the right system using the interoperability uh, piece in, in, in the middle of the architecture. Lovely, thank you. And um, just a heads up, we've got 30 seconds left to answer the poll and then we'll close it and reveal and then we'll do the next one. Um, so while we're counting down, uh, another question we've had through um, from John is saying, how do you prioritise the health conditions for your remote care and remote monitoring projects? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Who shouts loudest, of course. <laughs> um, not me today. <laughs> no, no. I mean, genuinely, we've got a, a fantastic clinical leadership in, in the trust and, and we've got a, a clinical outcome steering group, for example, led by deputy medical directors, uh, Dr. Magon, Dr. Farrow, um, uh, with great input from across our professional groups, as well as from our research department. Um, and so we, you know, we, we work things through in, in that way. Um, the, the plan's always that we need to have some, something manageable to start off with, um, you know, a cohort that's reasonably well defined and, and a cohort where we can achieve some, some success to build upon. Um, and so it does really help to have clinical champions within services um, and building that network is, is something that we're really actively working on at the moment. Um, so that then once we've got some success, we can shout about it um, internally as well as events like this to, to share it externally. Um, and then work forward. Um, I don't know if I, I can or have you want to say a bit more. I think um, it, it, it's probably worth also mentioning that we, we tried to steer away from um, that traditional sort of waterfall approaches as, as much as we can of, you know, specify everything to the nth degree, decide your order of priorities for all your conditions six months ahead of the time. So in, in the trust, we have a very strong continuous quality improvement ethos. Um, uh, and and, and it, 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 that sort of agile development uh, of continuously creating something, using it, understanding the impact of it, and then changing it if needs be, and then planning what to do next with it is very familiar to us. Um, and I think that that also allows us with, with the um, participation of the groups um, that Paul mentioned to continuously review that position as well, uh, because things do genuinely move very fast. Um, so sometimes, for example, we find ourselves uh, where uh, the acuity of a certain condition that we see maybe as a result of an event like COVID dramatically changes and we have to readjust our plan. So that agile approach, I think, lends itself uh, very well to be able to do that. Thank you. Um, we've got another poll question coming up. Um, this one is going to be up for two minutes. So again, if you please could take part, that would be amazing. Um, excuse me, I just had to quickly cough. <coughs> so this one says, which of the following is your organization's priority and highest risk in relation to systems integration? Uh, meeting the NHS digital shared care record, basic level of sharing data, uh, EPR to EPMA integration, transfer of care, um, or other. And like I said, you've got two minutes to answer that one. So please do take part. Um, so right on to the next question as we've got plenty coming through. Um, so this is for anyone, so anyone who fancies it. Uh, if you want to drive long-term innovation around these interoperable systems, and you mentioned a system neutral CDR, are you talking about an open EHR? Again, I'm not sure who wants to answer that first. Ooh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a question everyone wants, wants to answer. <laughs> uh, that, that, there's a good question of, of, of the HR as a standard itself. Uh, isn't something we're implementing at the moment. We had all of debates around how to restructure the clinical repository. Um, I, I think our decisions are heavily influenced at the moment by the environment with which we need to transact that data. So I think Mark mentioned, for example, um, we are deploying NICS wide shared care record as recently gone live. Um, SHPFT uh, so will be providing information into that one um, come hopefully next quarter. And, and uh, by and large, you just have seven and five protocols. So uh, for practical reasons, we have, we have chosen to organize a CDR in, uh, as five resources at the moment. 
but that doesn't mean that then you lose the flexibility over time if you want to change it. Uh, you can't change it into any HR, but we don't have an explicit uh, strategy at the moment to implement um, open HR. Paul, I don't know if, if you want to add to that. I know it's, it's a subject <laughs> very dear to your heart. Yeah, I, I've, I've been part of uh, ICS and regional work in the Eastern region. Uh, the East Accord, fantastic organization led by Kate Walker and others, has, has looked very hard at this. And I think they have a, a great model uh, now starting off in Suffolk and Northeast Essex. I think the pilot's happening uh, around using open EHR to, to start to solve some problems around end of life care. Um, so I'm certainly looking at it with, with interest and, and hoping that we'll be in a position to, to contribute to that in the future. Um, we are, um, as well, despite Hertfordshire being in the title, we're a provider across four counties, um, six ICSs, I think, and two regions um, straddling the eastern region and, uh, and out into Buckinghamshire as well. Um, so we, we do follow and, and engage actively with that sort of work. And I think, I think the Open EHR, uh, Open Air platform is, is probably a good one for that level of, um, of coordination. But yeah, pragmatically, we're, we're going with Fire HL7 for now. Yeah, and I think it's important to mention that, you know, that obviously fire is, um, I think uh, Hakan already alluded to it, is the fact that is that there's a, there's a, a lot of organisations that have already taken the journey around fire. And of course, that's evolving all the time anyway. Um, and um, at that direction of travel just seems to be less steps to take in terms of getting to where you want to get to at this point. Just, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it, 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 everybody in the call probably knows and, 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 and understand this, but it's also of, often um, we, we talk about fire and open EHR as if they're alternatives to each other. It's also worth recognizing that they, they are potentially different things. Yeah. Um, that the reason yeah. we, are, we have decided to organize the data as fire resources at the moment is because it gives us a defined approach to contribute to their shared care repository, which is what we agree uh, across the area. And, it, and, and because, like Mark said, we have a federated system in the sense that when a clinician anywhere in Hertfordshire in Essex um, opens that shared care record, it essentially comes to our systems, to um, our repository and says, what information do you have about this individual? And it responds in a live environment pre-organizing it as fire resources and transacting it that way give, gives the quickest response at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we had through, this might, one, might be one for you, Mark. Um, it says, has an overcome directly integrated with some of the key secondary care EPR providers to allow the data from other sources to flow into these systems? Yeah, so, so basically um, we have quite a lot of experience with the EPR vendors. Um, that are outside the UK, but actually are in the UK, if you see what I mean. So um, if I explain that a little bit better, so we, we have a project that was in the Wirral Hospital that is this Turner flagship site. Um, and although I think at the time um, there's the opportunity to go directly into the Cerner system, actually um, Cerner preferred that we actually went through the trust integration engine so, and that was to do with medical device integration. So, although it's completely possible to do that, um, the, uh, the, the sort of approach from the EPR vendor was actually, um, we prefer you to do it through the integration engine, but it's completely possible to do that. The second thing is we've got a very big site in Javascular in, 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 in Finland. Um, they're also uh, a CERNA site. And we're just doing some work around um, uh, connectivity opportunity in um, uh, for Epic. So those organisations, we do have um, we, we do have connectivity uh, workflow into. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. Um, another question. I'm sort of where we've only got a few minutes left, and I want to get through as many questions as I can. And um, this one's directed at Avier or Hakan. It says, were there any challenges within the trust IT or digital team um, in terms of resource experience and skills um, to roll out these kind of multiple projects and a digital strategy? And was there a reliance upon the likes of a Novacom or other suppliers to assist in this area? Why were there? Um, um, yes, there were some challenges. I, I think, especially when you uh, 
and work on a journey to do things that you haven't done before. That that challenge, I think, is is an inevitable. I think um, in the past we had a great degree of success. Um, so if you look at our uh, operational BI system, we call Spike, um, which which was um, jointly developed is an open source uh, with a third party company uh, who at the same time also uh, trained our staff to continue to develop it and maintain it. I think um, when it went live two, three years ago, um, it had something like 73 dashboards and KPIs on it. Um, I would hesitate to guess how many we have at the moment, but I think it's well over 400. Uh, and they were all being developed by our existing staff who have been trained. Uh, that way, and we took a similar approach, for example, with Enervacom around uh, around the trust integration engine, um, and I think that helps us um, to a certain extent to go over that and and create a sustainable solution that we know we can maintain, so that we only need to go to Mark and his colleagues for very complex things that we don't do very often, which we don't necessarily have to be experts on. Um, Resourcing, we had to resource it. You can't, you can't, you can't go into a journey like that with, without having appropriate resources. Um, we took a slight change because of COVID. Originally, um, when we developed the digital strategy, we spent a lot of time into looking at what resources would be required over five years to deliver these, and and how much invest, investment we will need to make as an organization. Uh, and and um, I, I suspect our original. Uh, approach to it was potentially looking at engaging with a, a third party throughout the journey of our digital strategy on the longer term to provide some of those skills. But with COVID, we very quickly realized that um, we would need a level of flexibility, which those type of contracts don't necessarily lend itself into in terms of deploying our staff. So if you look at what happened at COVID, uh, we had members of my team who were actually in the wards, supporting the wards, doing nothing related to their original role. So we, we do now have a, a delivery team, um, a, a department, a separate department um, that we don't have before we called uh, um, digital delivery team with digital delivery managers in those. Um, and also, I think throughout the journey, um, some of the uh, teams and departments we have um, we have um, changed and we'll probably continue to change the roles we have and, and the functions we have within the team. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Avi? Yeah, uh, definitely. A um, few things there, uh, because um, as part of the digital strategy, um, I think we did have a team structure as well change. So, but obviously on the development side, um, I think it was more about trying to realign the resources that we have got best so in that case, what we can do to free up all of the manual tasks that we are doing and trying to more to do the more cool kind of like uh, helpful stuff really. So uh, yeah, so there was a change. So um, obviously, um, and uh, NOOCOM, the integration tool that they provided, we are not subject matter experts. So in that case, any technology that we get, obviously um, there is a bit of consultancy. So in that case, where they train us in terms of how to use the tool, because it's kind of like Greek and Latin for us. And once that's done, then any projects that we do as well, kind of like uh, just the first two projects, we just take the assistance on in terms of what the best practice and others are. So, and after that, it's pretty much um, up to our developers or internet developers who do all of the managed maintenance side of things. So any new projects that we do get as well. So we'll have a first tab at it. And then obviously we'll get a code review by subject matter experts because it's our system, they know it best. So in that case, once a code review is approved, then we'll obviously deploy it and go live. So that's kind of like the practice that we use. And, and I think um, I'm just trying to understand the subtext in the question, but I, I would pro if, if I understand it correctly, I, I, I would agree that you don't want to be in a position where you create these solutions and you're completely um, reliant on, on the supplier to maintain and develop it. I don't think the suppliers would want to do it quite frankly. Yeah, and that, that's that's the whole sort of, um, that, that, that's, that's kind of where it plays into the strengths of what we do, is that we parachute people in when you need help. Um, the whole idea is to try and spread the, the use of the tools uh, across the NHS community. That's what we want to do. Um, and, and we're not we're not precious about saying you need to have this level of attainment before we do anything in terms of giving you extra support. 
we just literally parachute people in on a in the days that it's required to actually do that on a on-demand basis basically i think we are literally half one on the dot which i think has never been done before so well done to all of your timekeeping skills and we are out of questions anyway so that is very very good timing um so i think we will wrap it up there i uh, just want to say thank you so thank you so much sorry to everyone who's tuned in and thanks so much to our panel thanks to bradley thanks to hakan avi and mark um, i think it's been a really interesting session um just a quick plug from us we've got a packed schedule of webinars coming up so if you like today's please head over to our events page and register for plenty more. Um, but I'm going to leave it there and conclude today's webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.